One of the most important groups of trees in the forest are the oak trees. There's dozens of species of oak trees and they provide habitat for animals, they provide food for animals. Very, very important to the ecosystem, especially where I live here in the eastern United States. In this video, we're gonna go over several species of oaks that grow in and around my area here in the southeastern United States in particular. We are going to start off in the classroom where I'm gonna go over some basic terminology that you need to know moving forward with oak identification. We're gonna talk about the leaf anatomy of oak trees. We're gonna talk about the fruit of the oak trees, some basic characteristics of bark. And that's going to help you tremendously while watching this video. This video is intended for anybody that's an avid outdoorsman that, that's trying to identify oak on their property or a place that uh, you're trying to attract wildlife to. Perhaps you're taking a biology, a horticulture, and ecology class, and you're having to learn those oaks for an upcoming test. This video is for you as well. Each one of the oak species that we look at in this video, I'm going to chapter them individually. So if you are looking for a specific oak, say a white oak, what you can do is hit the see more or description button down below right here, and you should see each species chaptered out for you. So you can go directly to that species of oak that you're looking for. So let's go to the classroom. Let's go over some basic leaf anatomy of oaks, the two different types of oaks, what, how we differentiate them, and we'll go from there. So before we start to identify individual oaks, what I wanna go over with you first is just basic oak tree identification. There's some basic characteristics that all oak trees are gonna share. Then we're going to divide all oaks into one or two groups, the white oaks or the red oaks. So the white oaks are gonna have a certain set of characteristics. The red oaks are gonna have a certain set of characteristics as well. So all oaks are gonna have a few things in common. The first thing is that all oaks are going to have what we call alternate leaf arrangement. So alternate leaf arrangement means that they have one leaf per node and a node is a site of vegetative growth. And it looks something like this over here, this picture on the bottom left. You're gonna have one leaf and you're gonna go up the stem a little bit. Then you're gonna have another leaf on the other side. You'll go up the stem a little bit, have another leaf on the other side. This, the leaves on the stem, they're going to look like they're in a zigzag pattern going up the stem. That is called alternate leaf arrangement. There's two other types of leaf arrangements that we see on plants. That's opposite and world. Opposite would be where you have two leaves per node or the leaves are directly across from each other. World would be three or more leaves per node. So there would be three, four, five, six, however many leaves coming out of one node. The alternate, all oak trees are alternate. They have one leaf per node, which is going to look like this zigzag pattern on the stem. The next thing is all oak trees, they're gonna have clustered buds out on the ends of twigs. And so you can look at the ends of these twigs and there's gonna be anywhere from three to five to seven, sometimes more buds out on the tips of these twigs. All oak trees, their fruit is the same. Technically an acorn's a fruit. They all produce acorns. If you're watching this video, you probably already know that oak trees produce acorns. All oaks have monoecious flowering. What does that mean? Monoecious means that you have male and female flowers on the same plant. So they're not in the same flower. There's distinct male flowers called a catkin, and you can see that here in this picture. Uh, if you've ever had to clean out your gutters in the springtime, and, and they've, you've had these long, almost cigar-looking things by the thousands in your gutter, it is from catkins. So there's a bunch of different trees that have catkins. All oak trees have catkins. Pecan trees have catkins. Uh, river birches, so all the birches, they have catkins as well. The female flower is called a peduncle. It's very small. It's almost a reddish colored flower. Uh, very inconspicuous. You really have to get up close to find them. You'll see the catkins or the male parts hanging down in the spring. And another thing that we need to address is the fact that on each individual oak tree, the catkins will produce pollen at a different time than the female flower, the peduncle, becomes receptive. This prevents self-pollination. Some, on some trees, 
the female becomes receptive first and then the catkins release pollen after that and then it can be vice versa on the next tree. Sometimes the catkin will produce pollen. Once the pollen's been released, the peduncle or the female flower will then become receptive. Leaf anatomy of the oaks. So they all have a few things in common. They all have sinuses and lobes. So the sinuses are the indentations you see on the leaf here on the right. These are referred to as sinuses. The lobes are the protrusions. On some of these oak trees, you're going to hear me refer to it has five to seven lobes or seven to nine lobes. And what we're doing, we're just counting the number of lobes on this leaf. On others, you're going to hear me refer to the sinuses. And when I refer to sinuses, it's these deep indentions here. Some other leaf anatomy characteristics you need to be familiar with. The petiole is down here at the bottom of the leaf. So the petiole is where the leaf attaches to the twig. The apex is the very top of the leaf. And then the midrib is just the middle vein that runs down the leaf. So they're coming off the petiole straight up into the leaf blade or the green material. You'll see a, a dominant vein running right down the middle. That's the midrib. So we can divide oaks into two groups, the white oaks and the red oaks. And the white oaks are known as lepidobalanus. The red oaks are known as erythrobalanus. In general, there's going to be a few exceptions to this, but these are just general rules. Think about if you've ever had a math class, there's some rules to, the, to math, and then occasionally there's an exception. I want you to think of it along the same ways. So what we have is the white oaks, the lepidobalanus. Let's start with the leaves. The lobes of the leaves of the white oaks are going to tend to be more rounded. They almost look like fingers. The red oaks are going to tend to be more pointed. Acorns, so the white oak or the lepidobalanus, they are going to be very sweet tasting and they are going to ripen in the first year. On the red oak, the acorns tend to be bitter and they ripen in the second year. So they're bitter because they have something called tannic acid in them. So tannic acid acts as a preservative to the acorn because these acorns can lay on the ground for a very long time before they actually ripen and start to put down seed roots. Speaking of seed roots, so white oaks will put down seed roots in the fall, red oaks will put down seed roots in the spring, and then the bark. So bark tends to be gray and white scaly flakes on white oak in, in general and then on the red oaks it tends to be a dark colored some of them almost black and it, it looks like ridged and furrowed bark so let's take a look at the leaves so the two groups of uh, oaks we got the white oak and the red oak the leaf over here on the left is an example of white oak notice how these lobes almost look like little fingers protruding out if i see this i know i'm looking at a white oak over on the right See how they, we have these bristle tips out on the end? If I see these little bristle tips out on the end, I know I'm looking at a red oak. With the bark, on the, on the left-hand side, we have the white oak. Notice how it's kind of white, more of a white color, and it's flaky, scaly looking. And then over here on the right, we have the red oak. It's much more darker in nature. And look at the shape of the bark. So this is going to be more of a what we call ridged and furrowed. Some of our friends up north, uh, if you live in areas uh, where people ski, oftentimes they'll refer to this as ski marks. All right, so now that we've looked at some basic leaf anatomies, some, some of the basic bark, we, we know how to differentiate the red oaks and the white oaks. Let's go out and take a look at the red oaks and the white oaks. We're going to look at several species. We will start with the red oaks, and once we're done with the red oaks, we'll look at the white oaks. This is Quercus palustris, the pin oak. So pin oak is going to be a member of the red oak family, has bristle tips, it has deep sinuses on its leaves, usually five to seven lobes with those deep sinuses. Tell me that it's pin oak. Another way I can tell it's pin oak. Inside the interior branches, it has these little twigs that look like pins, and that's how I kind of remember it. This is another tree that I can tell from a long distance away in the fact that the lower branches tend to dip downward. The middle branches tend to grow straight out and then the upper branches tend to grow upward. But the overall shape of the tree is pyramidal. Uh, 
I know of some cities that have planted these as street trees or boulevard trees because it has a nice pyramidal shape. It looks good. They're extremely drought tolerant, but the problem is those lower branches grow downward and they're constantly pruning those up in order for vehicles or pedestrians to be able to get underneath them. It's native to the eastern United States from New England over west of the Mississippi River going up into Iowa in that, in that direction is where it's going to be native to. It doesn't get all that tall, uh, 70 feet tall. It doesn't get 100 feet like some of our other oaks, but it, it, it's extremely drought tolerant. It can survive in high and dry sites. Pin oak is prized for its fall color, has great fall color, red, vibrant fall color. A good overall tree. This is Quercus volutina, the black oak. In terms of distribution, this is one of the most widely distributed oaks throughout the United States. All up and down the eastern seaboard, all the way into the Midwest states, you will find Quercus volutina. This tree gets 60 to 80 feet tall. You can see here has a very dark bark. The bark tends to be ridged and furrowed, as you can see here. A telltale sign that I'm looking at black oak. This is something that, that I kind of figured out over the years seeing a lot of specimens. Where there is a branch coming out of the trunk, there'll be almost like a frowny face. I'll call it a scar or, or a growth scar where the branch came out. I'll try to get some B-roll film of that so you can clearly see that. The leaves of the black oak will have five to seven lobes on them and the sinuses will be very deep as well. This is a member of the red oak family so we are going to see those bristle tips out on the end of the leaf. I think you can identify this by looking at the bark. Here again where the branches come out you'll have that in quotations frowny face. You see five to seven lobes on the leaf with some deep sinuses, you're probably looking at a black oak. Our next tree is the Schumard oak, Quercus schumarda. This tree can become a true giant. There's some specimens that are over 120 feet tall. It grows quickly, however, it does not produce acorns as quickly as some of the other oaks. It typically takes 20 to 25 years for the Schumard oak to start producing acorns. This tree is often confused with trees like pin oak and nuttle oak, but there's a few differences between them. So this particular tree, the Schumard oak, is going to have seven to nine lobes. They're not as deeply grooved in. The sinuses aren't as deep as a pin oak. And then when we look at the branching habit of this tree, all the branching habit tends to be ascending in nature, where with pin oak, we start to see the lower branches descending in nature, the middle branches growing straight out, and the upper branches ascending on this tree. All of the branches tend to be ascending. This tree is native mainly to the southern United States. It does kind of branch up into Indiana, southern Illinois, Ohio, but mainly the Carolinas, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, westward into Texas and Oklahoma. One thing that we see with the Schumard oak is it can grow in acidic soils as well as alkaline soils. So you'll also find these trees in prairie soils. We find them in the black belt of Alabama where we have these deep, rich, dark black prairie soils. Uh, that region stretches from like just west of Auburn, Alabama to Montgomery to Selma and up through Mississippi is where the black belt is and you find a lot of these trees. A great tree for those particular areas, Schumard Oak. The next tree we're looking at is the Northern Red Oak or Quercus rubra. It has a huge native range. On the northern end of its range, it goes all the way up into Ontario and Nova Scotia and Quebec. On the southern end of its range, I'm really on the extreme southern end of its range here in Alabama. So Alabama, Georgia, into the Carolinas, you will find Northern Red Oak up and down the eastern seaboard this tree is predominant. It gets really big, over 100 feet tall, and one of the ID characteristics that we can use, it's a red oak, so it has those bristle tips out on the end. It's going to have seven to 11 lobes on each leaf, and in general, the leaf is what we call obovate, where the leaf is widest above the middle. This tree can grow in pretty much any soil type, clay soils, loamy soils, sandy soils, it's home in all those different types of soils. The one thing that it does prefer is a high and dry site. You're not going to find this a lot in, in wet, swampy areas, and it loves acidic soils. So the more acidic the soil is, typically 
the more northern red oak is going to like that up to a certain point, down to a pH of say four to 4.5. This tree behind me is one of the ones I'm most excited about sharing with you guys. This is the state champion Quercus Fellows, the willow oak here in my state in Alabama. There is not a bigger willow oak in the entire state than the one that's right behind me here. So willow oak can get really tall, get up to 100 feet tall. We measured this one in 2017, five years ago. It was 98 feet tall. I'm sure it's over 100 feet tall now. It comes from a very tiny acorn. It's, it's hard for me to imagine that such a huge tree can come from such a small acorn. One of the smallest acorns that we're looking at in this documentary is the acorn off the willow oak tree. ID characteristics for willow oak, parallel leaf margins. A lot of times what I see is people get water oak and willow oak confused looking at the leaves. But if you look at the willow oak, the margins will be parallel to each other. And on water oak, the leaf is going to look more like a baseball bat. This particular tree here behind me is probably well over 100 years old. I call this the founder's oak. I work here at Sneed State in North Alabama, and this tree sits on the campus of Sneed State. And this campus was founded in 1898, and there's very little doubt in my mind that this tree was here when this campus was founded. This is a true giant of a tree. Willow oak has ridged and furrowed bark. And you can see here behind me that the, there's ridges in this bark, not to be confused with what looks like mussels. So what old oak trees will do what we call buttress. So when you see these ribbons almost go all the way around the tree, we refer to that as buttressing and old oak trees will buttress. That's how you know this tree is really old. Any, tree, any oak tree that's over 50 years old is going to start to have this buttress look to it. Willow oak is native to the southeastern United States. So you're going to find this tree in northern Florida, Alabama, Georgia, the Carolinas up into Virginia, and all the way out across to East Texas, East Oklahoma, Arkansas. That's kind of the geographic region where willow oak is native to. Quercus nigra, the water oak, here behind me. This tree is going to be native to the southeast United States, North Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, and then up north up into the Carolinas and into certain parts of Virginia. In particular, in the native range, you're going to find this tree in lower lying areas. You can see here behind me, there's a creek. This is where you would find water oak. You can find it in more swampy areas. It will do well in a landscape. Once it's grown in a pot, it's, and it gets a little bit more mature, you can put it in a drier spot and it'll grow just fine. Water oak is gonna get as tall as it does wide, as you can see here, and it can get very tall. It can get up to 90 feet tall at times, which means it's also gonna get 90 feet wide. So if you are electing to use this tree in the landscape environment, make sure you give it plenty of room to grow vertically as well as horizontally. Oftentimes I see people getting water oak confused with willow oak. If you look at the leaf of a water oak, it's going to have more of a baseball shaped leaf. And when you look at a willow oak, it's going to have more parallel margins. So that's the way you can tell them apart is that the water oak, it looks more like a baseball sh shaped leaf. Quercus falcata, the southern red oak, as the name suggests, in terms of oak ranges, this tree is going to be native more in the southern ranges of oaks, in particular the southeast United States. So think Virginia down to North Florida over to Texas is where this tree is going to be native to. This is one of the trees that I can ID from 100, 200 yards away because of the way the leaves droop. To me, the leaves of the southern red oak, they look like they all point straight downwards and they look like bells. They'll have lobes. Most of the lobes are gonna be in numbers of three. Occasionally, you're gonna see a leaf that's gonna have five lobes on it. So three to five lobes on a leaf that is bell-shaped. Those leaves are pointing straight down. You're looking at southern red oak, Quercus falcata. This tree doesn't get as tall as some of the other oaks. So some of the oaks we're looking at get 100 feet tall. This one's 60 to 80 feet tall. I don't know if I've ever seen one 80 feet tall. 
Uh, the one I'm standing under here is probably in the 50 to 60 foot range, and that's a really big southern red oak. Our next tree is Quercus virginiana here behind me, the southern live oak. Southern live oak is typically evergreen in nature. Technically, it does drop all of its leaves kind of very late winter uh, into early spring, but what we see happen is that those leaves drop as the new leaves are coming out and so therefore there's always leaves on this tree <clears throat> to me it looks very similar to live oak and willow oak in terms of leaf structure but the way i tell them apart there's a couple different ways to me the leaves of the live oak are going to look and feel a little more leathery if, if that's if you want to use that as a as a horticulture term and then the leaves of the water oak and the willow oak are, feel a little bit more papery. So you can look at them and the live oak looks leathery, it feels leathery. The willow oak and the water oak, uh, they look more papery and they feel papery. In terms of size, these trees want to get wider than they do tall. They can get 50 to 60 feet tall. However, they get extremely wide. These trees can get over 100 feet wide, and in really old specimens, what we see is that the limbs, they grow out horizontal to the ground. They dip towards the ground as they go out, and then they come back up out towards the terminal ends. These trees also have an extremely large tap root. They go down very deep, and then from there, the roots spread out. So you have a tree that's wider than it is tall, has a really big tap root, which really benefits it in its native range. So its native range is going to be eastern Virginia, eastern North Carolina, eastern South Carolina, eastern Georgia, down into southern Georgia, the entire state of Florida, southern Alabama, southern Mississippi, and down into Louisiana. So the, the coastal regions of the southeast is where this is native to, an area that gets a lot of hurricanes. So this tree does extremely well in those environments because of its growth habit. This is Quercus incana, the blue jack oak. This is gonna be native mainly to the coastal plains of Alabama, Georgia, up into the Carolinas. We'll find it a little bit in parts of Mississippi and Arkansas, little isolated patch, patches in perhaps Oklahoma and Texas as well. But its main distribution is gonna be the coastal plains of the southeastern United States. This is mainly found in very sandy upland areas. You're not gonna find this tree in a floodplain or anywhere like that. It oftentimes gets confused with uh, species like live oak, but however, it is a different tree. And let's talk about how it's different from live oak. Number one, it doesn't get as tall. These trees usually get 20 to 30 feet tall. I believe the champion tree for this species is around 50 feet tall. It was found in Texas a few years ago. Also, the leaves are gonna be a little bit longer than a live oak leaf. So live oak leaves will be more of that four, maybe five inch range. These are gonna be closer to the five to six inch range. The key characteristic for me in differentiating the blue jack oak from some of the other oak species that you might get it confused with is the underside of the leaf. So the underside of the leaf has a very distinct whitish, bluish hue to it and it is somewhat pubescent. If you run your fingers on the underside of the leaf, you can feel some little hairs underneath it. And to me, that tells me I'm looking at blue jack oak and not a live oak or some other species that would look very similar to it. So this is blue jack oak, Quercus incana. This is the runner oak or Quercus pumilla. It is found in very coastal areas. So I want you to think Southern Alabama, along the coastal plains of Georgia, up into the Carolinas and down into Florida is where we find this tree. It's salt tolerant. It can grow right up close to the coast. It is very stoloniferous, meaning that the roots will produce new vegetation. As the roots spread on this, it'll produce vegetation and grow that way. It does not necessarily need acorns to take over an area. One plant can grow roots and more vegetation comes out and then more roots grow and more vegetation comes out. This is an extremely tall specimen here. Most of them are gonna be three to four foot in range. You can see here, this is taller than me and I'm six foot tall. This plant is pushing seven, maybe eight feet tall. 
and so it is a very large specimen for this particular oak, the runner oak. The leaves are going to be entire margins. There's no serrations, there's no lobes on these. Entire margins, they're very small, maybe two to three inch leaf. It looks very similar to a live oak leaf or a willow oak leaf but I don't think you would mistake them for either one of those species because this is more of a shrub form and the other two are very much a tree with a central leader trunk where the branches and the leaves don't start till six, seven, eight feet off of the ground, where this one has leaves that go all the way to the ground. And like I said before, it's very stoloniferous. This is the Myrtle Oak, scientific name, Quercus myrtifolia. This plant is found in extreme southern Alabama along the coastal areas of Alabama. So Mobile County, Baldwin County, and then somewhat in the very southern counties that are gonna border Florida, you're gonna find this. This is found in very sandy soils, does not get very tall. This tree gets 15 to 20 feet tall. Occasionally you'll find a specimen that's 30 feet tall, but for the most part, it's gonna be in that 15 to 20 foot tall range and it can get as wide as it does tall. So we'll see these plants get 15 to 20 feet wide. They're more of a shrub form than they are a tree form. Oftentimes these can be confused with live oak, but live oaks are gonna be much larger in size. The leaf looks very similar to the live oak, but these plants are gonna be more of a shrub-like plant. This is Quercus marylandica, the blackjack oak. To me, it looks very similar to post oak in the fact that the leaves have a, a very distinct cross shape to them. But I can usually tell this apart from the post oak in the fact that it does not have those really rigid branching habits, almost arthritic looking branching habits. The branching habit to me on blackjack oak is almost like pin oak in the fact that the upper branches tend to grow up, the middle branches go out, and the lower branches grow downward. You don't see that with the post oak. You see that more with the blackjack oak. Also with blackjack oak, the, the bark here is going to be more like a platelet bark. They're little square rectangle platelets all the way around the tree. This tree can get 50 to 70 feet tall. 70 is probably on the very far extreme end. This tree loves poor soil conditions. Rocky, sandy soils is where you're gonna find this tree. Oftentimes you will find this with a post oak. It looks similar to post oak, but if you use those characteristics that I described earlier, I think that you can differentiate the blackjack oak from the post oak. This is also a wildlife attractant. Deer, turkey, squirrels love the acorns off of the blackjack oak. This is a great plant if you want to bring in some wildlife to an area that has very poor soils or you're trying to grow trees in an area that have very poor soils, this is a good tree, mainly because it has a very deep tap root. It has a root that goes way down into the ground at a very juvenile age. It gives it an advantage over other plants in terms of getting some moisture and getting established on some very poor sandy soils that other plants have a hard time surviving in. This is the blackjack oak Quercus marylandica. Quercus alba, the white oak. You can see where this tree gets its name. As the tree matures, we see the bark turn white on this tree. Also the underside of the leaf. So the underside of the leaf is going to have a whitish tinge to it as well. The leaves are gonna have lobes, they're not pointed. So the, all the white oaks have more of a lobed leaf. And to me, these almost look like finger lobes, the way they protrude out. This is a major wildlife attractant. If you want to attract deer to your property, this is one of the trees you definitely want to see on your property. It produces a big acorn. It produces them in copious amounts. I'm looking at the ground here and the ground around this tree is just covered in acorns. Probably this tree right here alone will produce well over 100 pounds of acorns in th this fall. Typically, we're gonna find white oaks in non-floodplain areas, not on super high dry sites. They can do really well on mountaintops, uh, but those areas are dominated by some more other oaks. You will occasionally see a white oak right up on top of a ridgeline, uh, but they're hardly ever found in a floodplain. White oaks can get really big. They can get up to 90 feet tall. I believe the state record here in Alabama is over 90 feet tall. White oak is native to the eastern United States, northern Florida, all the way up to the New England coast, 
and then all the way over into places like Wisconsin and then back south again to East Texas, the whole eastern block of the United States, you can find white oak in the woods. This is Quercus stellata, the post oak. That specific epithet in the scientific name stellata refers to star. If you cut a limb cross section wise, the pith looks like a star and that's where that name stellata comes from. The leaf to me looks like a cross. It's a lobed shaped leaf, but it's also kind of shaped like a cross as well. The underside of the leaf also has a little bit of pubescence or tiny little hairs on the underside of the leaf. And those are some ID characteristics for the leaf. This is another tree that I feel like that I can identify from two or 300 yards away and it doesn't even have a single leaf on it. The reason being is its branch structure. To me, the branching, it looks like, for lack of a better term, witch's fingers or like arthritic fingers. The branching habit's not straight out. It kind of takes these twists and turns. It almost looks like uh, somebody's fingers that has really bad arthritis. And to me, that's just what it looks like and it's very easy for me to ID. Post oak doesn't get as tall as some of our other oaks. 50 to 75 feet tall is about as tall as you're gonna see one. So we're not this massively tall 100, 100 plus foot tree, uh, but it is still a very significant tree in terms of the bark. So the bark does kind of have some ridges and furrows, not as pronounced as some of the other oaks that we have looked at. And it's not all that uncommon to see the white bark on post oak as well. Post oak's native range is a little larger than some other oaks. We find post oak in eastern Nebraska and Iowa, down into Texas, all the way over to the Atlantic coast, stretching up into New York, and then down into Georgia in North Florida has a really large range. Within the, the range of post oak, where specifically is it native to? This is another one of our site indicator plants. You find post oak on property, that's where you wanna start looking at, at a building site. You're not gonna find native post oaks close to water. They're not gonna be in a floodplain. They're not gonna be in a swamp. You don't have to worry about building a structure and it flooding 10, 20, 30 years later if you've built it around a grove of post oaks. These trees prefer high and dry sites and that's where you'll always, you find a grove of post oaks, that's where you wanna start looking for a building site. For our next tree, we had to come to a low-lying swampy area here on the banks of beautiful Lake Gunnersville. This is one of my most favorite places to come to. There's a running trail here that I come to several times a week. Just a gorgeous place. But this is Quercus bicolor, the swamp white oak. This is found in low-lying swampy areas, as the name suggests, swamp white oak. It only gets about 65 feet tall. And the name bicolor comes from the fact that if this tree is in full sun, the top part of the leaf is gonna be a really dark, lustrous green. The bottom side of the leaf is going to be white. If it's more in a shady area, you don't quite get that bicolor effect, but in full sun, you will definitely see that. This tree likes full sun. It can survive in some part shade situations. It gets about 65 to 70 feet tall. One of the ID characteristics that you can use to identify this from a distance is that the upper branches tend to grow upward and the lower branches tend to be more pendulum going downwards in nature. And you're beginning to see that here on this tree, even though this tree is not fully mature, we can see these lower limbs start to bend down and these upper branches starting to go upward a little bit. Oftentimes this tree is confused with another oak tree that likes swampy areas and has a very similar leaf structure. It gets confused with the swamp chestnut oak. But if we look closely at the bark here on the branches, a telltale sign that you're looking at swamp white oak, it will have scaly or flaky bark on the branches. And that is a sign that you're looking at a swamp white oak and not swamp chestnut oak. Additionally, the leaves on the swamp white oak are gonna be more wavy in nature and then the leaves on the swamp chestnut oak are going to have more of a sinus or an indention into it than the swamp white oak does. Those are two trees that get mixed up a whole lot. Hopefully those two or three tips will help you separate 
what we're looking at here is swamp white oak from what it often gets mistaken for swamp chestnut oak. This is Quercus prinus or the chestnut oak. Sometimes referred to scientifically also as Quercus montana. It depends on which text you're reading. Is it montana? Is it prinus? But this is the chestnut oak. It is native mainly to the Appalachian Mountain region where the American chestnut was originally part of the native habitat. We lost a lot of those to the chestnut blight in the 1930s, 40s, 50s when chestnut blight decimated the area. But these often grew alongside chestnuts. So right along ridge tops, right along mountain tops is where you'll find this. This is a high and dry site oak. This is a site indicator. You're not going to find this in a floodplain. You're not going to find this along the river or a creek. It's going to be up on a ridge top somewhere. The leaf looks very similar to the swamp white oak. So we have this leaf that has these little lobes on it. But however, I don't think you'll get it confused with the swamp white oak because they grow in two totally different areas. Swamp white oak, it grows in a floodplain. This tree is going to be up on a ridge top somewhere. It gets up to 70 feet tall. I have seen some specimens a little bit bigger than that, in particular in and around the Great Smoky Mountains, uh, driving through there, places like Cates Cove. There are some massive, massive chestnut oaks growing in and around that area. This is a wildlife attractant as well. The deer love chestnut oak. The turkeys love chestnut oak. The squirrels love chestnut oak. This is a great tree. If, you, if you're on a ridge top, you're wanting to attract some wildlife, this is a tree that you want to look for, Quercus prinus, the chestnut oak. I debated putting this tree on this video because it is marginally native to where I'm at here in Alabama. This is a video about native trees of Alabama, native oak trees of Alabama. There are some isolated pockets of this tree. This is bur oak, Quercus macrocarpa. The main native range is going to be Midwest out into the Great Plains, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska. That's where you're going to find a lot of these trees. It is a very slow growing tree. It grows about a foot a year, but it can grow up to 100 foot plus tall. It also lives for an extremely long time. There's specimens out west that have lived for three or 400 years. A telltale sign that I'm looking at the bur oak is to look at the acorn. So the acorn of the bur oak is encapsulated almost entirely by the cap, if not totally encapsulated by the cap. And out on the ends, it has these little burrs, hence the name bur oak. Another ID characteristic, if you look at the leaves, we're going to see five to nine lobes. We're going to have some sinuses as well, but the sinuses are not near as deep as something, say, like a pin oak. The, the sinuses will be a little bit shallower. Another ID characteristic that we can use is the growth habit of these trees. They have a vase-shaped growth habit. They come from the central leader, and as we go up, the branches tend to vase outwards as the tree goes upwards and continues to grow. It's not gonna have branches that grow parallel to the ground, like a lot of the oaks do, or branches that the lower branches grow lower and the middle branches grow outward and the upper branches grow upward. We don't see that with this tree. This tree is distinctively vase shaped, as you can see with this specimen here. This is bur oak, Quercus macrocarpa. This is a very newly planted chinkapin oak, or Quercus muhlenbergia for the scientific name. We're going to find this tree in the southeastern United States and then moving upwards towards the Midwestern states is where its native range. In particular, we're going to find it around areas that have limestone deposits. It does not like a really deep acidic soil. It likes soils in the 6.5 to 7, even slightly alkaline soils up into maybe the 7.5 range is where you're going to find this tree. It's often confused with the swamp white oak is often confused with chestnut oak as well. It, we can tell it's not chestnut oak for a couple of reasons. One, where it grows. Chestnut oak will grow in some very rocky regions along ridge tops. This grows mainly along limestone deposits. We will find it elsewhere. But also, if we look at the leaves of this tree on the chinkapin oak, we see that there's not as the teeth on the edges of the lobes are not as defined as we would see with the chestnut oak. That's a key ID characteristic. So one, where it grows. Two, 
Look for the teeth on the lobes. If the teeth are not as pronounced, it's probably chinkapin oak. If you have more pronounced teeth on the lobes, we're probably looking at a chestnut oak. This one gets 40 to 70 feet tall. It grows very fast, up to about two feet a year, so it can get mature very quickly. It'll also produce acorns a little bit sooner than other types of oak trees. This is also a wildlife attractant. The deer, the turkey, the squirrels, they love the acorns off of the chinkapin oak. So this is a great tree to attract some wildlife. Quercus oglethorpensis is the scientific name for this oak. It's only found in one county in Alabama, that's Lee County, which is gonna be the Phoenix City, Opelika, Auburn area. Its main region of distribution is actually very, very small. It's found in eastern Georgia, in parts of South Carolina, up and down the Savannah River. This tree gets 65 feet tall and 10 to 15 feet around, so it's more columnar in nature than some of the other oaks that we have looked at. The leaf is very similar to water oak. However, with water oak, the leaves are gonna be more three to four inches in length. And with the Oglethorpe oak, these oaks are gonna be more along the six to seven inch long range. So they're much longer than a water oak, but just like water oak, they have that baseball bat shaped leaf. The bark on the Oglethorpe oak is gonna be scaly and it's gonna be gray to white in nature. You can actually use that as an ID characteristic. So if you see an oak, with gray, white, scaly bark, and it has this baseball bat shaped leaf that's six to seven inches in length, and you're in the native range. I think that's really key with identifying this. You're not gonna find this in a lot of areas. This oak is very, very rare. It's probably Oglethorpe oak. This next oak tree is not a whole lot to look at because we're approaching November and a lot of the leaves have dropped off of it. But this is an oak that's near and dear to my heart. This is the Boinkin Oak or Quercus Boinkini. This tree was a major part of my thesis work for my master's degree at Jack State. I did a plant community analysis at Oak Mountain State Park. And the group that I worked with were the first group to identify the Boinkin Oak inside of the Oak Mountain State Park just south of Birmingham, Alabama. It's only found in five counties in Alabama, which makes it extremely rare. And this is like a, a central Alabama going up through northeast Alabama endemic plant. So if you're familiar with Alabama, this is Jefferson County, uh, St. Clair County, Shelby County, up towards Etowah County is where you're gonna find this tree, in particular on sandy glades on mountains. That's the only place that we found it in Oak Mountain State Park, and it's the only places it has been identified elsewhere. This particular specimen is in the Arboretum at Auburn University, and it was planted here as a specimen plant only. Does not get very tall, 30 to 35 feet max. The ones that we found at Oak Mountain State Park, none of them were over six to 10 feet tall. It's more of a bush than it is a true magnificent oak tree like we would think of like a, a post oak or a white oak or something like that. The leaves of the Boynton Eye Oak are gonna be entire margins until you get out to the tip and then you're gonna have three to seven finger-like lobes on the tips of each leaf. This is Quercus acutissima, the sawtooth oak. So the name sawtooth oak comes from the fact that the leaves kind of look like they have little saw teeth on them. The leaf resembles that of a chestnut. If you've ever seen a chestnut leaf, it looks extremely similar to a chestnut leaf. This tree is not native to the United States. It's native to Asia. It was brought over here in the 1920s. Uh, and where it does grow in the United States is the southeastern United States, Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, North Florida, Alabama, all the way out across to East Texas. In some states, it's on the invasive species watch list. I think in Virginia and North Carolina, it is on their invasive species watch list, meaning that it's kind of escaped captivity. It's taking over where some other native oaks may grow. It's, it's not as big a deal as like kudzu or privet, but it's something that you need to be aware of. This tree grows extremely fast. In 15 years, it can be 30 feet tall, which is fast for oaks. It bears acorns at a young age as well. Four to six years, this tree will bear acorns. So sawtooth oaks can bear acorns at a very, very 
young age. A lot of oak trees are not going to produce acorns until year 10, year 12, maybe sometimes even year 15, depending on soil conditions and weather conditions. But sawtooth oak produces them readily. Sawtooth oak is also a wildlife attractant. I had a professor at Auburn, he had a saying about sawtooth oak. If you're a deer hunter, this is your tree. He would say that a legless deer in the Yukon would crawl on his belly to the state of Alabama to eat the acorns off of the sawtooth oak. Now, how much truth there is to that, I don't know. It was funny, I remember it from 20 years ago. I, I laughed and I still laugh thinking about it. But I know a lot of deer hunters and deer hunters love this tree. If they have an opportunity to plant oak trees on their property, they're looking for sawtooth oak. Sawtooth oak doesn't get as tall as some of our other oak. Sawtooths get maybe 60 to 70 feet tall. The bark can sometimes be an ID characteristic. It does have a whitish bark and it is a ridged and furrowed bark. 